So I want to take her. Well, to the the private drive. Okay. So I want to take her somewhere. Well, I don't think there's that's the reason why I have I'll to leave early at this point. I'm going to take a little bit of my fish for a few hours and just sleeps all day. It looks well, and maybe we still do it. But then I have a granddaughter's birthday party and help her. That's the reason I drive out of the day. So that I can leave alone and go to help her at some granddaughter's birthday party. I don't know. Guys, fish with me. I think she gets headaches and you're getting headaches and she's telling you I get sick. What time is that party? Yeah, we're going to the evening. So I was joking. Around here, but this is actually yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. No, I'm being 100% yeah. real. Oh, yeah, dude, 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 dude. I told all the guys that they were It's not true. I'm like, it's really fun. It's funny. Oh, yeah. It's funny. 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 It's so are we all set up? Yeah, she oh, mentioned it. Ready to go? So, you guys are already good. That's a lot. For sure. For sure. For sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Our club really suffered from the COVID one. Yeah, yeah. So last night it was packed. We normally have 19 or 20 people. Uh, uh, we might have nine today right. if we're lucky. Yeah. Okay. Hey, we're all right. Either way. We won't be yeah. offended. That's the show. Uh, you're okay, I, I hope. If we record and post to YouTube, hundred percent. Okay, right. awesome. okay. I don't know if the division will fire me at that point, but now, yeah. Don't say anything. That. All right. All right. So, welcome to the July Rocky Mountain Anglers meeting. Hello to all those here and all those out there on YouTube land. Our guest speakers tonight are Ranger Sierra Schaefer and Conservation Officer Mikhail Brantley. McKay. McKay, sorry. That's okay. So uh, I'm going to turn the time over to them and they are going to give us a guest talk on voting regulations and such. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Sierra Schaefer. Just wanted to introduce myself a little bit before. As you can see, I have a picture of us doing <laughs> ice rescue training, and then I've taught some little kids. I actually started down at San Hollow State Park um, over three years ago now, and I'm currently at Deer Creek State Park. I started as a seasonal, and I've been with the uh, state for about five years now, and I've been a ranger for three of those years. And uh, my name is McKay Braley. I'm a conservation officer with the Division of Wildlife Resources. Um, I've been working with the division for a few years now. Uh, originally, I worked as an aquatics technician up in Bear Lake, working with the cutthroat trout. Um, and so, fishing is near and dear to my heart. Um, but then I've been an officer for about three years in the strawberry region, so I never got away from the cutthroat trout. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about me. And the pictures are from we did a, a, a I can't even think of the word now. We did a sheep survey up in the Uintas. Um, that's a me in a helicopter and. Just a few of the uh, potentially uh, poached elk that we have in, in strawberry as well um, that we had a picture with. So, yeah. Here's our kind of an overview of the things that we're going to talk about. Um, the boating stuff specific is over here in the green, and McKay's going to talk about the stuff over in the blue. So, we're just going to cover mostly boating safety equipment, personal flotation devices, some of the common violations we're kind of seeing out in the red boards how to boat safely, some of the statistics we've seen, um, cold water safety, I know we're in the middle of summer, but it's gonna get cold fast, and then boating and alcohol. Um, and then I'll be kind of going over, you know, you guys are, 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 are pros at fishing, but I'll kind of go over some of the general fishing regulations, a few more specific ones, and kind of go over um, some of the, uh, the, the common issues that we see out in the field, um, as well as a couple stories as well. Um, and how we go through our donation process, and then also the UTIP hotline. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about um, is our safety equipment that's required to be on board every vessel. I'll hand out these boating safety laws to you, and they're right here as well. You can open it to the center, and it shows you everything you need for what length of boat you have. Um, two of the main things are making sure it's currently registered and insured. Would you like me to pass for you? Sure, if you'd like to. Making sure it's currently registered and insured, making sure you have proper bow numbers, which that um, boat that will also have stuff about in it. Making sure your registration is current and you have those stickers on your boat as well. 
Um, type 4 throwable, looks like that square with handles, replace those old white circular ones that you would throw to someone if they fell overboard. Making sure you have an adequate number of life jackets for every person on board, they have to be Coast Guard approved. We're seeing a lot of those new like um, float jackets that people use for wakeboarding and stuff like that. Those aren't even legal to use for wakeboarding and they are not a life jacket. Um, making sure you have a fire extinguisher, making sure you check it to make sure it's not expired. They're only good for 12 years, so the number on the bottom or on the label will show when it was manufactured and 12 years from that date is when it needs to be replaced or when you use it. And then making sure you either have a horn or a whistle, it can be like a whistle, air horn, or if your boat has one, that's also great. A spare paddle um, or even like another trolling motor, so if you have a main motor and then a trolling motor, that counts as your spare propulsion. And then a bail bucket or a bilge pump. And this is our picture that is our new campaign about life jackets. They're so important for everyone to wear. Um, I'm sure you've heard about all the recent drownings in the state, four of which have been at Deer Creek this summer, unfortunately. Um, if you're wearing your life jacket, uh, your seatbelt to get to the park, you should probably wear your life jacket when you're out in the water. And I just have a fun state parks video. Are there riding tickets for someone without a life jacket? Yes, so we do write life, uh, life jacket tickets all the time. You don't have to wear them if you're over the age of 13 on your boat, even though we do recommend wearing them at all times. Um, but if you don't have adequate life jackets, we absolutely will cite for that. license requirements. Obviously everyone needs a valid fishing or combination license in the city of Utah to fish. 
Um, you need to have it on your person, and, and, and I'll kind of go into the app in a second, but it happens quite frequently where I'll be out in the water um, on strawberry, and I'll be checking fishermen, and they won't have their license with them, and so they'll try to bring it up on their phone. All is well and good. I want to make sure that you do are able to bring it up, but a lot of times you don't have service, right? So what ends up happening is if I don't have service and, and you don't have service, um, it's important to have that app, you know, pre-downloaded um, with your license on there because you won't even need service to bring it up. But what ends up happening in those situations where I can't check it and and, and, and you can't um, bring it up is typically what will happen is I'll write you a citation for fishing without a valid license. I'll get your phone number and then I'll go back and check later when I have service and I'll give you a call later to say hey because you didn't have it in your person but you do have a valid one it's just a warning citation just to say make sure you have it on you next time um, and that's typically how it goes or if I call you back and say hey turns out you don't have a valid fishing license. Does that kind of make sense? Um, and then moving on to equipment regulations, um, obviously uh, Utah is a state with you can have two poles. Um, there are artificial fly and lure sections only, um, specifically like in the Provo River and Chumming. Um, this picture right here, uh, I had a couple of uh, younger individuals um, try to, they were ice fishing up at Strawberry <coughs> and they tried to hide a bucket from me as they were coming in. And uh, I went and checked over the bucket and they, it was full of fish and they're like, oh, that's not ours. And, I was like, I saw you bring it in, guys. You know, and so uh, after talking with them for a brief moment, they, they ended up just like throwing this at me. And they're like, sorry, we were chumming too. We were throwing this down the hole. And I was like, all righty, I would not have, uh, <laughs> I appreciate you being honest with that. Um, and then moving on to size and limit regulations. Uh, obviously with, with strawberry, uh, you have the slot limit and there are other areas that do have the slot limit. Um, you know, depending on the body of water that you're at, you could have different size restrictions, so just make sure you're checking on the fishing guidebook. Um, there are some places um, where you can have a two day possession limit, so like at Strawberry, um, you can have two days worth of, you know, in your possession, so if you're leaving Strawberry and for some reason you're pulled over or whatever, um, you know, as long as you have, uh, you can show that they had the copies yesterday and, and whatnot, you guys would be good to go. Um, so yeah. So, we'll move on to the next slide. For Question. This. Yes. Um, on licensing. Yes. I have uh, grandkids come in from out of state mm -hmm. and, and, uh, with great grandkids. Uh huh. Want to take them fishing. Does the parent that helps them have to have a license if they're out of state? So, so no. If the child is fishing and you help them cast, uh, no, you are not required to have one. Um, in the sense that. So if, if, a if you're helping a child, so there's a big difference. So I've seen people who, have, who are genuinely helping their child, right, who's, who's actively fishing and whatnot, but then there's the people who will be like, yeah, my kid's fishing with the barbie pole, but the kid's over playing in the, the, the sand 30, you know, 30 yards away and doesn't ever come touch the pole, right? So then those are, uh, that's a little bit different of a situation. But going directly to your question, no, they do not directly need one. As long as, long as they're just, actually right there helping. Yep, as long as they're just assisting. Boat, they'd have to be right there anyway. So. Yeah, as long as they're just assisting. Okay. Not a big deal. Um, you got a question in the back? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Okay. And then the, uh, the position limit, uh, like starvation, overnight walleye fishing, uh, mm -hmm. does that qualify for having a, a two day limit or possession? So you're saying limit? if you caught one like at 11 and then you're fishing overnight and then it goes on to the next day? Is yeah. that what you're saying? So. Let me double check for starvation, because I don't cover starvation, so let me double check. But I'd imagine if if you are fishing at overnight, just looking just looking at it, I think you'd be fine. I think you'd be fine just to have um, where you know you're obviously fishing the night before, whatnot. So I think you'd be fine. But let me double check. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Uh, as far as night fishing. I, would, I wanted to go night fishing last week over at uh, Deer Creek, uh -huh. and everybody pulling out, and they told me you can't stay overnight. So that's actually going to be yeah. more into her, her. So I'm one of the rangers at Deer Creek. Last year we did not allow night fishing whatsoever. When the gate closed at 10 p.m., no one was allowed to be there. Our new park manager is saying that night fishing is allowed, but boat camping is not allowed. So as long as you're up actively fishing, you are just fine. We do recommend as you come through the gate telling someone so that you're night fishing and they'll give you a special little tag that just says night fishing on yeah, it. I'm, and I'm not 
going night fishing so I can sleep in the boat. And yeah. Catch fish. No, I know I, a lot of people that will save their night fishing to come camp on their boards. And we go, well, every once in a while we'll do night patrols out in the water. Is the gate locked if I, if I got off early and wanted to leave? Can so I you can always get out, but you can't come back can't in. Can't come back in. Yep. All right, that's what I was concerned about. Yep. Uh, but I'm going to go back there. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a son-in-law who loves to go out night fishing with us, but he doesn't fish. Uh -huh. Doesn't take a pole, doesn't fish. Uh, sure. So there will be like me, my daughter, and him. And two of I mean, my daughter and I both have licenses. He doesn't buy a license. Uh, is is that going to raise any issues if we get checked? No. So if I if I what what well, let's say I come and check, there's four poles out, right? And there's three three people there. I, I may ask if like because uh, honestly I, I'd be too bored if I didn't have something to do. So I, I always ask people, but it's never in the sense of like I know you were fishing, right? It's never an accusatory thing. I just ask if they've been fishing, and if they haven't been, then you're good to go. All right? I yeah, it's not an accusatory thing. It's just I'll just ask typically. So does that make sense? Yes. Thanks. Cool. All righty. Um, and I will not forget about the starvation thing. So don't let me forget. So. Um, so going on to the, the slot limit, so there's some uh, strawberry and Schofield, I believe they're the same, um, whereas uh, for cutthroat trout, you cannot keep uh, cutthroat trout measuring between 15 and 22 inches. Um, the reason being is because the chub population will outcompete the rainbows in kokanee, and they're the only predator in there. So we really, really thrive on our, on our cutthroats. And I think uh, recently our bios have come back and said that um, the chub population will never go away, but they have stabilized at a low because of the cutthroats. So it's been super, super good fishing for kokanee at, at Strawberry recently. Um, there are some areas where you have to have immediately release. So like Pelican Lake, Bluegill, and Green Sunfish um, is an immediate uh, release. Um, immediate kills. Uh, so Utah Lake has an infestation of, of Northern Pike. Um, so if you do catch one, it's just an immediate kill. They're not supposed to be there. Yes, sir. Uh, we heard of in a previous meeting that there were some northern pike in Utah Lake that had been tagged. Yes. And if you caught one, you were to record the tag number and release the fish because they want to track those. Yes, that one that is true. So if you do catch a tagged fish, um, the best thing to do in that situation is to get the tag number and release it. Um, and then uh, obviously our file and, and give our, our central region office a call or whatever region you're in. Um, and our aquatic section would absolutely love to know that. Um, so yes, that is a big stipulation there. We okay, would appreciate thanks. to put it back. Um, for closures, uh, specifically, and, and this, this applies to uh, Strawberry as well, but Bear Lake, um, all the tributaries are closed April through July, um, and that's because of the cutthroat spawn. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Did I not hear rumors somewhere earlier in the year that some reservoirs were just allowing their limits just because of potential hot, high water or low water and high temperature? Yeah, so like, are, are you referring to like Minersville where they allow bait now for like, so they've changed the regulations for certain mm -hmm. reservoirs because uh, of the drought. Um, but like Minersville specifically used to be an artificial fly and they were only area, but now they've allowed bait. Um, and I understand that Yuba and Otter Creek and some others that they've taken all the limits off. Yes, yes. Okay. Because they're, they, they, the potential for that lake to be, con or reservoir to be completely drained is, is relatively high. So, so then how is that posted? Because I was just looking through like the regulations and obviously there's, there's nothing in there because of a late <coughs> addition to the information. But do you mark that at the reservoir when you drive up? So we do try to mark them as, uh, our aquatic sections are as always busy marking with new signs and stuff like that. But if you're looking for the most up-to-date information, what I would highly recommend, if you have an inkling that a reservoir's like got something like that going on, is is to go to our website or just call us directly. Um, because I think honestly, I, I I prefer to talk to somebody rather than go on, online. It's never you know it depends on the day, right? Um, but just see if you can get the most up to date things, because obviously they're not reprinting the the guidebooks. Um, so with with that being said, I would highly recommend just looking at our website because we have all the most updated. Uh, fishing regulations posted on there. So, makes sense? Yep. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to jump into like some of the common violations we're seeing. Um, Utah is a no before you go state, so you're required to know the laws before going out in the water. 
Um, I think it was mentioned quite a bit last time that you guys are also seeing this same issue. Speed and proximity is one of our biggest issues out on the lake, especially with all these new wakeboard boats coming out. Everyone wants to go play. Um, so Utah law does say that you, with, you can't be above wakeless within 150 feet of fishermen on shore, anyone in the water, buoys, marinas, other boats, something like that. Um, we'll go into how to report it when you do see it later on, but I'm sure you guys have seen them constantly out there. And we're, it's one of the big things we're hitting, and I have a video on it with another ranger talking about it in the, I think the next slide. But definitely our biggest thing. So if you see it, we'll show you how to report it because we want it reported. Um, and then another big violation we're seeing is children under 13 not wearing life jackets. Going back, life jackets are so important. Everyone should wear them at all times, even if you're over the age of 13. And then we're also seeing a lot of people not registering and insuring their boats. It's just like a vehicle driving down the road. You want to be covered, so I would recommend always having it registered and insured. Um, and some of the common violations we see on the wildlife section um, is, is one of the number one things is fishing without a valid license. Um, with that being said, uh, you know, we definitely have discretion in how we handle that, those types of situations. If somebody's like, you know, and, and, it, and, and it depends on the situation, right? But like if somebody's one or two days expired and they've had, a, you know, all this license purchase history and we can see that, you know, they may, they may get a warning, right? It, it just depends on the situation. Um, and then uh, uh, beyond fishing without a valid license, uh, unlawful take. So there's two typical ways we handle fishing vi violations in the sense that, let's say an illegal fish has been caught. So if, let's say a fish at strawberry is 17, or cutthroat trout specifically, is 17 inches. Um, there's two ways that we handle that. The first way is unlawful take. Um, unlawful take is just typically a fine uh, and, and doesn't come necessarily with, with the suspension of a, of a fishing license or you know, your combination license or whatever. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a lower level charge. Want destruction is the you know the increase of the unlawful take. So want destruction, if, if we you know deem that the situation is um, you know if, if somebody intentionally broke the law and, and hits the criteria of matching within within uh, uh, statute, it may increase the want destruction, and that's where you pay the fine, um, similar to unlawful take, but there potentially comes a suspension of your fishing privileges. Um, we we. We make sure that these these types of situations are warranted. We don't just go around. If somebody makes a mistake, we're not going to charge them want destruction, right? If if but if somebody's intentionally um, abusing the resource and stuff like that, that's when we'll typically uh, go into want destruction territory, and that comes with its own administrative process, and everyone's given their their ability to fight that within the administrative process. Just, and just in the, this last week on the site on your site. Mm -hmm. I see where somebody left two stringers full of fish just left them on the bank. Yeah. The was that at the Jordan River? Yeah. Was that at the Jordan River? It was at the Jordan River. That's yeah. what I saw. I'd only seen a few things on it. Um, a situation like that may warrant want destruction. I don't know the, the entire case details. I'm, I'm sure that's the Utah County or Salt Lake County officers dealing, so I don't know all the details mm -hmm. for that. But that type of situation would probably warrant want destruction, just depending on, on the situation. So they're high. They're handled by the JP court or by administrative court. So, so there's two processes. So, just with the unlawful take, there's a criminal process of it. So that would be handled with the justice court, because what it is is a class B misdemeanor. Um, so the justice court would take care of that. But for the warrant destruction, it's still handled within the justice court unless it, it goes up to class A, which is depending on a certain amount of fish and. It kind of depends on a few things, so it might go to district court. So as far as the criminal process goes, it's justice court or district court. And then what happens is, is, is if you get charged with want destruction, what would happen is, is uh, the officer would file an additional report towards uh, basically an internal report for the Division of Wildlife, um, and it's called a license suspension process, whereas uh, that's an administrative process with it handled within the division. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I have a question about the the wake the wake boats. So I've had a huge problem with those, and, and I was just wondering if, if there's been any talk about increasing the distance and also increasing the size of the wakelet zones. Because like I, I've been to Deer Creek the past three out of four weeks, and there's guys who they'll drop their borders inside the wakelet zone and then start going, and I almost crushed my foot because my boat was bobbing up and down trying to trying to put it on my trailer. And, and those wakes are just so much bigger than they used to be when those regulations were made. There's definitely talk about it. Deer Creek. Uh, yeah, Deer Creek is 
I think we have to see the most speed and proximity and most lakes around and it's awful. And we're trying to do our best and that's why I'll talk to you about how you can report it to us so we can even get more of these people. Um, within our boating program, there's definitely talk about increasing that because that's pretty small. I mean, 150 feet is about three school buses as we say, but especially with these giant wakeboard boats coming out producing massive wakes now, that's not far enough. Um, we are, Deer Creek specifically, is looking to expand our wakeless area by the docks because we're having the same issue. Um, our issue right now with that is having chain that's long enough because it goes out so far and then it just drops down. So we're just in the process of getting more chain to make that bigger for everyone. Cool. Here's a pretty picture of Deer Creek. Um, I'll just play this video to start. about Cash App. Now, Cash App lets me send someone money with a few quick taps. The hot, dry weather is driving a lot of Utahns to lakes and reservoirs. That's right, but as Fox 13 Spencer Joseph shows us, drought conditions could increase accidents on the water if boaters aren't careful. When temperatures go up, everyone goes to the lake for fun. We still have a lot of water bodies that are still open. When Utah hits 100 plus degree temperatures, heading to a lake or a reservoir is a pastime. But this year, with water levels low, being out of the water comes with a new concern. With less surface area, that brings the boaters in closer. And when you start to crowd people in general, problems kind of do arise. This is Ranger Chase Peely. Well, I've been on for about 10 years. and. I've been out at Starvation Reservoir, Wizard Bay, worked up at Pine View, um, done some time out at Jordan L. So he's seen a lot. Boating safety is what I'm mainly involved in. With less space on reservoirs now because of the drought, he's going to be on the lookout. Rangers are going to use any tools at their disposal, including boats like this one, to actively look for any safety or law violations while out on the water. The biggest one that we look for is the speed and proximity laws. Vessels staying 150 feet away, because that seems to be the most dangerous one that I've seen in the past. And it's not just looking out for other boats. Where we have fishermen, we have skiers, we have wake surfers, we have swimmers, we have kayakers, we have paddle boarders. And with low water levels, underwater hazards might be more dangerous too. So keep a lookout, follow speed and distance laws, and don't boat while under the influence. But most of all, wearing your life jackets on all vessels is what we advise. Because in the event of an accident, it could save your life. Spencer Joseph, Fox 13 News, Utah. All right. Um, so just being aware of people in the water, watching out shorelines, fishermen, especially with like, because of our water level dropping, we're seeing less boats out in the water and a lot more kayakers and paddle boarders. So being aware of them, they look smaller. So uh, just, yeah, watching out for them. And then being aware of all of our water levels dropping, I checked this morning and Deer Creek is at 65.7% now. We're dropping about a half percent to full percent every single day now. Um, so are a bunch of reservoirs. This graphic right here is from June 21st. It was kind of showing all of the water bodies and their percentages in the state right now. Um, they're dropping rapidly everywhere at this point. So underwater hazards are becoming a big deal. You guys boat at Lake Powell. Obviously everything has changed down there and there's a ton of hazards. Deer Creek has random <coughs> bars close to the shore. So being aware of those as well as Jordan now having the same thing. Um, and then here's our link for our current open ramps. I'll click on that to show you guys. Dear, um, Utah State Parks updates what ramps are open on a weekly basis, so you can always check here. The ramps that are currently closed are Antelope Island, um, Echo just closed, Rockport is almost closing, Yuba has a ramp that's closed, I think there was one more. Um, and then Paiute's ramp is closed. So you can always find out which ramps are closed, which ramps are open before heading to the water body. Any questions about that? <clears throat> um, here are some of the statistics from 2020 about boating accidents. The total amount of property damage accidents we saw was 30, total injury accidents we saw was 60, and the total, total fa boating fatalities was 10 last year. Um, nationwide, obviously the number one cause of death is drowning. 
people aren't wearing their life jackets. Um, alcohol is also a big thing that we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and the main cause of accidents is operator inattention. We're seeing a lot of more violations with people not having observers in the back. Um, so observers are required if you're like wakeboarding, you're tubing, stuff like that. We're seeing a lot of people not having someone that's watching them go down. Uh, so this is kind of the boring slide. Um, but this, this is kind of uh, just a few things that I was able to drum up. I was able to get 2020s um, statistics. Um, but this is just kind of a graph. So the top one is showing fishing without a valid license. Um, and, and how many citations were given. Those can be, you know, including warning citations. Um, as you can see, it's kind of dropping here, as well as for the unlawful take, um, you know, we're seeing that slightly go down. Um, and this is specifically for fishing regulations. Um, it's not involving big game or anything else like that. This is just specifically for uh, fishing violations. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we could be seeing a drop um, in, in, in the amount of citations. Um, a lot of them are through correlation, not necessarily causation. Um, you know, we've seen during those three years, we had more officers each year. Here, you know, from, from 2017, we had more officers and we've lost a few in 2018. We lost a few, we didn't pick up as many officers. Um, so that could be part of the reason. Um, part of the reason could be is that there are just less people involved in wildlife related activities, um, as well as we could just be seeing higher compliance. Um, I, I wouldn't be the one to, to, to be able to tell you what exactly is causing these things, but these are just some interesting numbers that I uh, were able, was able to draw. These are still fairly relatively high numbers, you think. You know, these are fishing, just fishing related in 2019, 218 across the state. That's, you know, that's a lot of fish, right? So cause I think the average is two to three fish for every unlawful take. So, I mean, you're looking at, you know, thousands of fish that were unlawfully harvested um, throughout the, those years. Um, so, so I just wanted to bring up one interesting story. Um, last year, uh, I called this the Kokanee Caper. Uh, you can go to our wildlife blog um, and you can see some of the stories that officers have written about interesting cases, things like that. Um, so this individual was pulled over by a highway uh, trooper for speeding and uh, I get a call from dispatch and the trooper's like, hey, uh, I don't know what kind of fish these are but I don't think he's supposed to have them. So he sends them to me and he's like, yeah, they're bright red. And I'm like, yo, those are, those are kokanee. Um, so I go ahead and head out over there. Um, it was like two minutes away from my house, so it wasn't a big deal. Um, so I go over there and start talking to the guy. The guy's in a Honda Civic and he has this open bag, like a, like a fishnet bag, sitting on the back seat with all these kokanee. And it's like October. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty disgusting. Uh, it's kind of a weird, weird way to travel with your fish, but whatever. Um, the guy, uh, he, he said that he had, had, you know, at first he was saying that he had just caught him and then I finally was talking to him and he finally admitted that he had just scooped him out of the, out of the river. Um, and, and he was aware that he shouldn't have been doing that and that he knew that they were unlawful to possess at, you know, uh, at Strawberry Reservoir during that time. Um, and so this is kind of one of those situations where wanton destruction was warranted. Um, an individual was aware of what he, he was doing was wrong, and yet he decided to do it anyways and thought he could get away with it. Um, so it kind of shows with the coordination between agencies. Um, you know, Utah Highway Troopers, Park Rangers, they keep their eyes out for wildlife violations, and we try to assist them when we can as well. Any questions so far? Okay. Try to keep them easy. Yes. No good. Uh, ramp open at Deer Creek? Both ramps are still open. On the south. Yeah, the island and the main entrance, both are open. So you'll kind of you'll see us in all sorts of different ways, and this kind of includes both of us. Um, so you'll see us in our trucks. We'll go in and check people, um, you know, just that normal way. But during the during the ice fishing season, strawberry is completely iced over, and occasionally Deer Creek is, is too. You'll see us out on snowmobile, uh, snowmobile, can't talk, um, boating patrol. Um, I have an aesthetic Hawaiian shirt, so if you see that. You all can't be wary, right? No. Um, and then checkpoints. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys recently checked social media, but we are having a, a checkpoint um, uh, for relatively soon in Strawberry. Um, and we are required to, to post that um, to, for notice. Um, so, I, I have an interesting story about a checkpoint in Strawberry. Yes, sir. 
you nail the guy that had uh, an unbelievable number of kokanee in his car coming out. And uh, I mean, like four or 50 kokanee. Of course, the limit's four, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. ticket for it. I only have one question for you. Yes, sir. What was he using? Yeah. <laughs> and then one I like to know. <laughs> I always get too impatient trying to catch coke, and he always just get bored, and I start going for cutthroats. He wasn't required to tell you what he was using. Huh? No, no, he was not required to tell us as much as I'd like to know. Um, but yeah, other than that, I have one other question. Are you doing a Creel survey yet? Deer Creek now? Uh, so our aquatics is, cur is is over that. I think they did one in uh, Deer Creek last year. I think they do an interval of three years. Five. Uh, is it five? Okay. I, I knew in the northern region they did five, but I was I thought it was three for the central region, but more likely than not, you are correct. Um, so the donation process, I get a lot of questions of where the fish go after we uh, end up seizing them uh, from an unlawful harvest. Um, so basically what, what we try to do, and Heber's a very unique place, not very many places have this, but what I try to do is I try to donate it to the food shelter. They will take wild meat, or wild game meat. Um, so it's super awesome that they're able to do that and I try to get that to them as much as possible. Um, we, are, we, we get in trouble if it goes to spoil, right? We personally get in trouble if, if, this, if these fish are allowed to spoil. Um, so I make sure that they're donated. Now, not every time I'm taking them to the food shelter, occasionally I will take them to other fishermen. Um, so that way if it's a hot day, there's no way for me to get all the way back to Heber to go donate that by the end of the day. Um, I will donate it to people who will eat it. Um, so I am not allowed to eat them. So if anyone ever thinks that, we are not allowed to. We'd get in some major trouble. So, yeah. And you also do the same thing with um, elk and deer and stuff like that. We went on a fun patrol last year um, together looking for violations and we ended up finding this guy that had unlawfully taken a deer in a place that shouldn't have been, but we happened to be in my vehicle and I unfortunately drive an Explorer and not a truck. So we had to figure out how to put that deer in my Explorer somehow or all of my gears in the back. So we quickly found a nice hunter that had a valid license without a Utah and we donated that to him. Yeah, her explorer smelled like dead deer for a couple of days afterwards. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a bit about cold water safety. I know that we're in the middle of July right now, but obviously you guys fish year round, right? Thinking about his upcoming family trip to Moab, what kind of meat to pick up for his barbecue tonight, and how many fish he's going to say he caught. He's not thinking about the one thing that could save his life. 80% of boating fatalities can be prevented by wearing a life jacket. If Tom took the next 10 seconds to put his on, he'd have an 80% better chance of surviving this. Cold water, uncontrolled breathing, waterlogged clothing, and a state of shock are making it very difficult to reboard his boat. Not to mention that he hasn't done a pull-up in over 10 years. As a last resort, Tom thinks about swimming back to shore. Exhausted, cold, and disoriented, statistics show he's not likely to make it before drowning. Tom's now thinking about his kids growing up without a dad, and why didn't he put on his life jacket? When you're on the water, it's the first thing you should think about, not the last thing you ever think about. Nobody is invincible. Wear your life jacket. Um, so there's a 110-1 rule that states that when you fall in cold water, you have one minute of uncontrolled breathing. That's when a lot of people take in a lot of water because that initial shock of the impact of going in cold water. Then you have 10 minutes of worthwhile movement. Um, so you'll be able to use your hands for about 10 minutes before you won't be able to. And then you have about an hour until hypothermia sets in. I have this graph here that shows the percentage of accidents that are fatal by month. And as you can see, most of the accidents that are fatal by month occur in our colder months here in Utah. So taking um, prevention, you know, always telling people where you're going, especially if you're ice fishing. I have a graphic about that showing kind of our ice safety guide, when you should be out in the ice. Um, obviously, ice is never absolutely safe, so taking precautions. Um, having those cleats around your neck, we rangers carry those whenever we go out and check ice fishermen, and just letting someone know where you are in general, and knowing how to self-rescue. Um, alcohol, let's see if this is going to be Hey, headed out on the lake, I see. It's 
Fish aren't gonna catch themselves, am I right? <laughs> Got some brewskis from my broski. No, thank you, that's illegal. What? Come on, aren't you the guy that wrestled the buffalo on Antelope Island? First of all, they're called bison, and I was delivering a breech calf. Wow, come on, man. I'll trade you this six for a sub for that life jacket. A real man always wears his life vest. And he never partakes of alcohol while operating a boat. Everyone knows that. Not, not everybody does. Everybody knows that. Got me. Um, so the same alcohol laws that apply to a regular vehicle apply <coughs> on a boat other than the open container rule. So people can't actively drink on a boat as long as they're not driving the boat. And if the driver has alcohol, it cannot be within his reach whatsoever. It has to be below the legal limit. Um, yeah, boating under the influence carries the same penalties as a regular DUI. The legal um, limit is 0 .05. It was changed two years ago two years now. Ago. Um, yeah, passengers or operators with a higher level, they're more likely to die while boating, and they're more likely to have accidents, which causes death. Um, and then Operation Dry Water, this is just a statistic nationwide from 2019. We hold checkpoints and saturation patrols every, it's around 4th of July usually, called Operation Dry Water. It happens nationwide, um, and it looks like in 2019 there was 563 U, 63 BUIs out of that. Um, we're mostly checking for safety, making sure everyone has life jackets and everything on board as well. Um, and then open containers, they're still being on a boat, so just being conscious of that if you do decide to drink on your boat. Here's another pretty picture of Deer Creek over by Sailboat Beach. All righty. So this this slide was not is not completely fully up to date. So UTIP everything here is accurate. However, the division has also implemented a new text based. Um, app called TIP411. Um, it's just as, as useful as, as UTIP, whereas you can uh, basically text uh, out a, a potential issue uh, similar to UTIP instead of having to go over the phone. Um, you know, it's just an app, so just type in TIP411 um, and we're able to uh, get those that information. Just realize over text though it may take longer because we're out of service. Um, we're less, because how the UTIP chain system works is let's say an individual calls this number for a slot limit violation at Strawberry Reservoir. If I am out of service, because I'm the first officer on that list, because I'm in that area, it will go to the next officer, Heber City, and then the next officer if he's unavailable, right? So it goes up to 10 officers. Um, whereas, you know, so you might be on hold, so please be patient just because some of us are not always in service or not always on, on, the, on the clock. Um, so, but with the TIP 411, it doesn't work that way. It just shows up to, uh, for me, so just realize that it may take some more delay. So there, there's a positive and negative um, as far as those go. Um, so yeah, UTIP, uh, when you call this number, uh, the, the number one thing is don't ever confront a suspect. Um, let us handle that. We don't want to have you guys put, put yourselves in any, uh, any danger or risk because people are crazy sometimes. And even the slightest little thing of like, hey, that's a, that's a cutthroat, and they're like, no, it's a rainbow, and then it turns into a fist fight, right? Um, so don't, don't do that. Um, the main thing is, is, is where are you at? Um, you may have colloquial terms for it, so like people will call it the portals, right? But if you're able to get GPS coordinates, that's even better, right? Because not every officer is gonna know all the colloquial terms, right? Um, so GPS coordinates are, are the best thing ever. Um, and then uh, what information should you, uh, should you provide? Um, so obviously the suspected crime. So what's going on, right? Um, a license plate, any kind of identifying uh, uh, information, right? But the thing is, when we're out hunting, if somebody says, hey, some guy, somebody poached a deer up in Strawberry, I don't know where I'm at, but he's got camo on, he's, he's a white guy, and he's about 40 years old, that ain't gonna really narrow down the system, right? So <laughs> uh, it's gonna be kind of difficult. Um, but it, it is important, if, if they are wearing something that, that kind of does make that unique, even if it's just you know white shirt, black shorts, something like that, then that helps us once we kind of narrow ourselves, once we get in there, we kind of figure out what's, you know, who's, who are we looking for, more specifically. Um, so don't, don't think that that's useless information, um, but just kind of try to keep that in mind of like, okay, how useful can this information be for this, uh, for this particular situation? Are you uh, required to uh, check uh, hunters as well as fishermen? 
What was that? Are you required to check and cite hunters as well as fishermen? Yes, yes. So uh, I spend a lot of time this year. I actually have not been able to uh, work as many fishermen. I've been working at um, some bear poaching cases. Um, so uh, we are we are spread a little thin, but we do try to make sure that we address any concerns that get brought up. So we we, we try our, our our best. So going to back to reporting speed and proximity or any other crimes that you see out on the water. This is the information that I need from you if I'm going to be able to see it and go find them. So I need bow numbers if you can get them. Um, if you happen to get a video of it actually happening and you can send that to me, that's evidence right there and that's awesome. Um, what kind of vehicle information that say they just loaded their boat on the trailer, I can still cite them if they're off the water for it. Do you have a question? Yeah, that's good. Uh, there have been a couple times at Deer Creek where when we had repeated buzzing by yeah. boats too close, simply the act of standing up with our video and doing this as they go by mm -hmm. has scared them off. Oh, they, wow. That they, they think they're, you know, they know they're going to record it, but at the time, I didn't have a contact that I could send it to. Yes. So, you know, this um, is very great. So, very great yeah, sense. and so if it's an emergency, like someone's injured or actively being hurt or something like that, mm -hmm. always kind of call 911. Deer Creek is in Wasatch County, so it's Strawberry and Jordanelle. Here's that non-emergency dispatch number. Will you read that out, please, so Absolutely. we can capture it, just in case we can't see it on camera? Yep, that non-emergency dispatch number is 435-654-1411. And then I'd also recommending, before you head out to a state park, programming whatever their main office number is into your phone. So in this situation, I'd recommend, especially at Deer Creek, calling our main office, reporting it to whoever's there, they'll immediately send to whatever ranger is on duty, and then we'll have, if we don't already have a ranger on the water, we'll get a ranger on the water. We like to make contact with whoever's reporting it, that way I can give you my cell phone number so I can get whatever video, whatever pictures, anything like that you have. Um, another important part of this is if you're willing to sign as a witness. So if I didn't actively see it happen, I need a witness to be able to sign. Um, if you choose not to do that, I it would probably just get thrown out in court very easily. If you want to sign as a witness, um, there's a possibility that you may be called into court to testify, but with that video evidence or picture evidence, it's unlikely. So can we text to that non-emergency number? I don't, uh, I don't so. think so. Let me find So that non-emergency number acts basically as a 911 number, but it just goes directly to dispatch. But it, when you call on this number, it's like, hey, this is not life or death situation, right? So what will happen is, is that whether it be a wildlife violation or whether it be a safety violation, you can call this number, you'll get disconnected with the dispatcher, and these dispatchers are fantastic, especially in the Wasatch County area, and basically what they will do is they will say it's a safety violation, or even a wildlife thing. If I'm not on duty, uh, uh, Ranger Schaefer here has gone on to Strawberry to go, uh, in, to, to go deal with that violation, right? That's been called into dispatch. Um, but I do not believe they allow, I don't think they do text. No, I know Wasatch, you can text into 911 now, but not that non-emergency number. But Deer Creek specific office number is 435-654-0171. Yes. And, and that is a... That is our front gate number for Deer Creek. I know you have enough oh. people in the office that they always answer. And that office on the south? That is the main entrance on the far south as if you were headed to Provo. Last slide. I think this is the last slide. Any additional questions for us? Yes. Um, apparently, I've, I've seen this presentation once before, and I've already added Wasatch County Dispatch Good. in my contacts, but it shows an internet contact for that, that looks like it might be an email address. Oh. WCPR at co.wasatch.ut.us. Do you know if that's an open number that we could? Because again, that would be someplace where we could send a video if we. So, so what I would recommend is this: is just call it in because what will happen is, let's say it's a speed and proximity yeah, thing. So then, what would happen is, dispatch informs her, and then she's going to call you from her direct cell phone number, or I will. So yeah. at that point, like, hey, yeah. you have a video, and then now you have that cell phone number attached to the direct <laughs> officer. So now, I, I think that's the, the easiest way to get this done. So I, I can sit there and say, okay, those are slot limit cutthroats. It doesn't have to be yeah. like. Okay, now I got to go talk to Wasatch County again to go see if they could find it through their email system. Highly just recommend once you've done that, you say, "Hey, I have video. Do you mind if I text it to you, or 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 we'll ask you?" And that's the I think the best way for 
first. All right, thank you. Uh, I had a question. So th there's, Deer Creek's always got a problem with parking too. Yes. Um, and I see a lot of double parking of cars instead of trailers. Like, is is there spots for just cars or I? how does that work? Because when I was pulling out, I had to come back around so I clean my fish mm -hmm. and there wasn't any trailer spots and there was probably at least 10 different spots that had a single car in a double trailer spot. Yeah, so we can only do so much about parking. It gets to the point where people just park where they want because it's kind of a monkey see, monkey do issue. Um, Rangers, we do site and tow vehicles all the time. It's, if those sites are marked. Um, in our main entrance, not all of them are marked as trailer parking only. So we do allow cars to like double up. Um, obviously not a lot of them do, but that's becoming one of our bigger issues over at the island. Um, people are parking in those stalls and we are absolutely siding and towing people. So we're trying to alleviate that because people obviously want to get on the water. Um, there is a highway expansion thing that's going to be happening in the next couple of years and we're hoping to get a ton more parking at the island hopefully here soon. And, and the other thing I would just bring up and, and this is something where Deer Creek has three park rangers that are actively patrolling. Um, if, if we don't immediately respond, please be patient with us. I mean, uh, they have three officers, which honestly isn't a lot of people in the summer. Like and we're they, also over the Provo River and yeah. Strawberry Reservoir. So, so like for the Strawberry Reservoir, typically if they got a busy day at, at Deer Creek on there in the summertime, I'm probably one of the only people out at Strawberry. Um, potentially Wasatch County might have one deputy out there. Um, but I cover from, you know, the douche, what was that? Some troopers. Yes, maybe a trooper. Um, but, but just realize that if we're in a fairly remote area, we are not thinking anything less of, of your situation. It just may take us a minute to get there because of the location and just because we may have multiple things that we're trying to do at the same time. So please just be patient. We do try our best. I, I'm still looking for starvation. So one second. Yeah. Sweet. Any other questions for us? Yeah, I'd like, uh, kind of like to have the Schultz and the Rex where uh, somebody can help us chill out without having to have a license to fish. What was that? So the, have an adult help, help a, a grandma. Yeah. Yeah. Can you find it in there? I didn't find it when I was looking, but I, I got interrupted, so I didn't get all the way through. So, Specifically for that, so there's a, on, on page eight, it goes under, it says if you're under 12 years of age, you do not need a fishing license to fish in Utah. You can use, you can fish without a license, use two poles, use a set line, and take the full daily limit. Okay. So there, page eight, um, so all it does say as far as kids go is, is literally that. If you're under the age of 12, you do not need a fishing license to fish in Utah. You can fish without a license, <coughs> use two poles, use a set line, and take a full daily limit. There's nothing in there that states that they have to fish off of their parents' fishing license or anything like that. Okay. Whereas, it just doesn't spell that out. Yeah, if they're the ones, the mainly fishing, and let's say the mom or dad or who, whatever guardian or is over them that day, you know, says, you know, hey, I'm gonna help you throw that one out, and they're maintaining the poles. And I get it, kids' attention spans. You know what I mean? Like, as long as there's activity with the kid going on, you're okay. You're gonna be just fine. Um, and and uh, like I said, still looking on starvation. Awesome. While he's looking for that, I just wanted to remind you guys, we are statewide law enforcement officers, so if there is an emergency, 911 will get us there as fast as possible. Um, if you ever see us like driving down the road, yes, we are law enforcement. Yes, we can pull you over. I don't recommend speeding past us because we probably will. Um, and we're here to help you. So especially if you're broken down on the side of the road, we may stop and pull behind you and help you out, change a tire. So we're it's here for you in like recreation and wildlife as well as everything else. That's what I did on the way up here. I told my hands are dirty. Awesome. Well, I have some speed and proximity flyers I'll Easy. hand out to you guys, and I have a bunch of stickers if you guys would like some. Yes? Um, now, you're going to be just specifically for Deer Creek, but have you noticed, is there, is there more or less confrontation between fishermen and non-fishermen in, in, in the name of, there's a lot of different variety of water coming around in the water? Because yeah. Of like, I don't remember the name of them, but the little kite, the little hydro kite. The kite stuff. boards, yeah. The kite boards, and now my friend was, was talking about some sort of motorized paddle board. Yeah. And, and, and I'm like, okay, now this is something new that 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 is coming up, and you know, some principals are seem to have a lot of, well, like the, the 
kite boards and another probably have different mechanized things. What do you tend to have up at Deer Creek and is there an increasing problem? Um, I haven't seen too much of a problem. Lately I have here, been hearing from fishermen that complain about jet skis getting too close and trying to like beach over their lines. So I've had a couple of those, but I haven't had too many complaints about fishermen. I feel like most of our population is respectful of other people. Obviously the wakeboard boats as an exception. Um, we're working on that, but our kite boarders tend to stay on that far side unless it's super windy Then they'll come like as far as the island um, But I haven't heard of fishing being too great that way So I don't really see too much of a confrontation between the fishermen and other people over there we But actually, if there is something report it to us so we can take care of it We we do actually see so now strawberry reservoir seeing more wakeboard boats things like that stuff that you wouldn't see about five years ago just because strawberry was always seen as a fishing reservoir, right? No, no one ever really thought of it as a recreational lake. But we see people towing, you know, um, towing people all the time, water skiing on, on strawberry, and I, I still think they're crazy because it's too cold. Um, as far as, as that goes, I think people have, there have been complaints here and there, but like Ranger Schaefer said, um, I think most people are fairly respectful, and I think once people like, you know, if people have an open dialogue about it, we're like, hey man, can you not be so close? And as long as you're respectful to them, they'll more likely than not, I usually see people be like, yeah, I talked to that guy earlier, he took off, he, he, he was cool with me, you know what I mean? So just, you know, if you start out angry, they're probably gonna react angry. So try to be, just try to promote that, you know, respectability. I mean, when in doubt, call us, that's why I get paid for you, so. Okay, starvation. Who have the question again? All of us. Oh, we're going yeah. there. Okay. Because we're going there this weekend. <laughs> okay. On page twenty, you may possess up to two daily limits of fish as you travel within Utah, or if you leave the state, as long as you meet all the following conditions: at least one of the limits in your possession was caught at a Utah water on a previous day, and the fish were a legal species and limit for the water body that were that you caught them on. The fish from the previous day have been cleaned and gutted, entrails removed. If you fish at a different water body on the second day of your trip, you may not have any fish in your possession from either day that violates the rules of the water body where you're currently fishing. You must always comply with the size and species regulation for the water body where you're fishing and not have more than two daily limits in your possession. Um, so for example, they use Joe's Valley Reservoir. So for example, if you catch a cutthroat trout, that would be legal to possess, let's say, where's a, where's a, Body water near strawberry that has a decent amount of cut cuttings around. Um, Rockport. Rockport. Let's say Rockport. So let's say you catch one at Rockport that's 17 inches long, and then you come over to strawberry, right? And then you have that in your possession while you're fishing at strawberry. That's unlawful to do because it, does that make sense? Because yes. it, it's violating the, the the water body, right? So for example, that starvation uh, uh, specific explanation, where you know, let's say you were night fishing. And then at that point, uh, you know, you're you're fishing the night before, uh, and and you've got the walleye, whatever you're doing, you're fine. You have two day, you have a two day possession limit. You're just fine. As long as you've got the first day's catch. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. And they have to be clean. That's the that's the kicker with us because yeah. we're going overnight, so we'd have to clean our first day's catch. So so just realize too. Let's say let's say we're doing a night patrol and it's 12:30 in the morning, and you know we go over there and you have. Let's say you caught your full possession of walleye from yesterday and today, and you're like, hey man, we, we just caught them at 11.30. We're also not, we're not there to, to bust anyone for who isn't trying to break the rules, right? So just realize that we may, like I said, there's discretion, right? So like, hey, it's like, hey, just go ahead and got them real quick. And we're good. You know what I mean? Just just realize that there's those types of situations, but there's only, there's so much discrepancy, right? So. Makes sense. Do each of you have a business card with your name and number on it? I do. Nice. Could I have it? I, I will go grab it because oh. I totally forgot mine in my truck, but I will go grab mine. I have one more question. Is there any noise regulations? Because the other thing I've seen is like the wakeboard, the wake guys, like you can't wakeboard or wave surf or whatever they do without like having 311 blast at 7 in the morning yeah, the either. And they're right by the campsite. Yeah. So it's like, so you ask her on that. violations in almost every state park is from 10 p.m. until 7 a.m. So it's one, right at seven. Okay. Out. So yeah. that only applies to state parks. I don't believe there's any like that kind of restriction at places like Strawberry that are federal. Yeah. So I'm not sure about that. I, I don't think there is. So I don't know if you're going to get a deputy sent down your way. Yeah. I mean, I was just curious. I, I'm, I'm not going to report that, but 
<laughs> Unless they're playing like, like just terrible. Britney Spears or something. I don't know. Yeah. Did you say you had some? Oh, I left them at home. I'm sorry. Oh, but I can give you my email with like that. Give me the paper and mark and put it right here. Here's Sierra. Absolutely. I got this right here. Oh, just right there. Okay. But, yeah. Any other questions? No? Okay, sweet. Well, thank you for thank answering you all our much. questions. There's a lot. Yeah, there is a question. Yes, it was. Not a real big deal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Taking somebody fishing that has absolutely mm -hmm. zero experience. Uh huh. In a boat. I guess so. Where can we go and catch a bunch of bluegills or How something? Um, I've been a state park ranger for three uh, years. Powell. Just hit my That's three year in May. Pardon? Tell you what. Yeah. You know what you need to do? Take them out. Do you have a boat? Yeah. Take them out to Strawberry. Go put a white curly tail with a jig head on it and worm topper on it. You'll catch a bunch of cutties. Like you'll catch, you probably won't be able, won't be able to keep many, but you'll be able to catch a bunch. Like catch I, a lot of them in the, in the slot limit. Right? Yep, a lot of them are in the slot limit, but that seems to work really well. If I'm fishing hard that day, I could probably catch one during fishing a day. Yeah. And I, during this time of year, so the, the fall, even better. Fun. So. But yeah, Mentor is more would probably be another spot to go to. Um, if you if you want to fish for smallmouth, I mean Deer Creek, uh, and you can go up in Wallsburg and avoid a lot of the wakeboard boats that way. The other place I really like to go that I <clears throat> I, I always catch my take all my nieces Where? and nephews up there is if you go up to Penguish Lake. There's no wakeboarders. There's a, it's really chill and there's a lot of trout. You'll catch tons of trout just. Just saw that. Penguish Lake. Penguish. Yep. Okay. It's a really nice lake. Okay. Um, well, everybody, uh, those in the room know me. I'm David Hanson. I'm the vice president for uh, Rock Band Anglers this year. We'd like to really thank uh, Agent, or excuse, excuse me, uh, Officer uh, Braley and Ranger Schaefer for their time tonight. Thanks so much. Um, special thanks to Shields for letting us use the facility. Uh, shop at Shields, they're really supportive. Um, next thing uh, for club, club business. Um, Dell, do you want to go over the uh, uh, bank account business? Can do that. Or if you want, what we can do, let's just do that for the folks in the room after we cut off the, the uh, recording. Is that okay? Certainly. All right. Um, check your email, guys. If you're seeing this and you're not in the room, uh, we've had reports that people are not getting our emails because they're not checking their spam folders. We're sending out all of the emails and newsletters, etc., as blind uh, carbon copies so that not everybody's email address is published to the world. So check your spam folder. If you're not getting stuff from us, that's probably where it is. With the exception of Lee, who we try to exclude at every chance. Um, this coming Friday, the club is gonna be uh, going up to starvation. So anybody that can go, uh, the only thing that we recommend, of course, is uh, be safe. Don't fish all night long. We've done that before when we've had internal club tournaments and we fish all night long because we're catching fish all night long. That's an unsafe drive home the next day. So please recommend that you get off the lake and get some sleep before you drive home. Um, speaking of Shields, Shields is, is uh, willing to help us host a walleye seminar. DNR is not going to be doing as many fishing seminars as they've done in the past. Shields will allow us to host one here. We already have the last presentations that were given, but not recorded and put on YouTube. So we're thinking of aiming for March. Uh, I will be coordinating, Randy and I will, uh, Randy is president, Randy and I will be coordinating with uh, the, the folks here at Shields to schedule it. Shields will help publicize it, and we're also uh, hopeful to get DNR to help publicize it as well, and maybe we can get in touch with Adam Eco and some other folks to, to get it publicized. Um, in August, after our, you know, we, again, we'll meet the second Tuesday here at Shields, second floor training room, and usually the Saturday following that, traditionally in October and in August, has been when we go back to starvation on Saturday and fish during the day. 
So that's sort of penciled in unless we hear that there's some really hot fishing reports somewhere else. Um, if fishing stays really good at Willard, maybe we're going to go back to Willard. We'll see. And that's just about it for tonight's business. We appreciate everybody's attendance and a special thanks to Mike Badger, who is doing the technical aspects of this and the recording and we'll be posting it for YouTube consumption. Um, thanks all. I had, a, I had a matter of business I wanted to bring oh, up. Please so do. One, of the, one of the things as, as we were kind of having to uh, inject the club with some new people, you know, we've lost a lot of people and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think we've kind of thinned the herd a little bit. Um, with people who are dedicated to the club, but one of the one of the things I wanted to propose was an option for a junior membership in our club, and and my idea about that was to allow um, people who are under the age of eighteen to have a youth membership in our club that have non-voting rights, and and that way we could get some engagement because I know uh, I know there's been a few people who have said, well, can I join that walleye club? And it's an adult-only club. And I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I, I think it would be a very interesting option to get some new, um, to get the next generation fishing, fishing walleye. So that's something I wanted to bring before the club and see what you guys thought about it. So it sounds like, you know, I mean, do you, did you have a dollar amount? I mean, I'm assuming they I, I was, lose or? Yeah, I, I would I would <clears throat> say probably half the amount of a of a full full fledged membership for, for anybody under eighteen. Exactly, and and it would allow them to be, you know, with me I have kids, so the people I fish with are kids most of the time, mm -hmm. um, and it would allow a lot of people who are younger and who are fishing with kids to involve their kids in fishing and let them be part of the club in in a kind of a um, passive capacity in the club. They wouldn't be able to serve on boards. They wouldn't be able to vote. Uh, things like that, but it was just a thought I had, and I know my kids would love to be part of a club like this, but they're just not welcome right now. That's a great idea. But I want to get your feedback. Uh, I know. Yes, I, I don't have any real problems with it. Um, Should we uh, float that as an idea in the newsletter and in the emails so that we can try to get some feedback yeah, from those audience? Yeah, 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 and, and, and vote on it next month. Over the winter, we can present that as yeah. you, know, you know some sort of charter change. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to add a, a youth membership for somebody under eighteen. And, and maybe maybe as the club, why that's not something they're interested in. I'm open to that too, but it doesn't just, hurt uh, to it doesn't hurt to try it. But yeah. there, there, there's no harm in there. I mean, so so it'll and, and that gives us a long time frame because it's what July now. Get it out in the news. Exactly. And I was thinking even with this walleye seminar. If that's something that we did want to do, we usually have this seminar open to the public. There's a great option for that. And I know a lot of a lot of the people I've talked about will I go fishing with my kids, so being part of the club, mm -hmm. it's just not gonna work. Well, I'd suggest that we uh, have the e-board discuss it and then make it right. okay. and, and then put it up for a vote for the yeah. club. Yeah, great idea. Okay. Um, and another thing the e-board probably needs to discuss is do we want to thin out the email list um, yeah. and try to have it be more for people that are paying dues, um, something to think about. I mean, it really doesn't cost us anything to send it out, and it ha does help keep people in touch, uh, but maybe what we do is we send out a, uh, an email saying, if you want to stay on the list, reply, otherwise, no. So let them opt in, and, uh, you know, it's just a thought, but again, I think that that's something the e-board needs to discuss uh, and then the club vote on perhaps next month. Okay. And I have one more matter of business Please. is, uh, especially if we're gonna do a seminar or something like that, I would like to have the option to, um, to buy new hats so that we can have those for purchase or some kind of swag for our club because, I mean, it's fun to have a Rocky Mountain Angler shirt or hat, and we don't have that option for anybody who, who's new and comes in and gets excited about the club, sure. which helps promote also on the water, because I wear my hat when I go fishing. There is a stock of hats somewhere. I got them. You got them? Okay, well, I if we got some. some. We, we have, we do have some hats. Yeah, we do have a golf hat. And the other, the, other, uh, the other thing I was thinking of is possibly if we wanted to try to get more engagement is some type of door prize or something, I don't know, for a meeting, something to get people to come to our meeting so that we can have a good vote and so we can get a little bit more engagement. Um, whether that's a $5 Shields gift certificate or something like that, something small, just so that we can get people to 
show up in person. I'm not talking about a lot. I'm talking about like three five dollar gift cards, and we just have a sure a door prize for. Well, uh, we've done that in the past. Right, but that was usually what donated uh, either Shields, Cabela's, or Sportsman's would would give us gift cards. Um, through the last couple of years, that support has dried up to a large extent. So we might end up having to use club club funds in order to get <coughs> two or three, you know, five dollar gift certificates or something. I mean, it's not a lot of money, but it's still nice, and, and you, can, you can spend that in a second on your way out after yeah. eating. So. All right. I'm sure they'd like to go. I, oh, I, yeah. oh, no, oh, we're okay. I'm, just, I'm in no rush. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think we can probably stop the recording, and Dell can give us the financial picture. Okay. And 